Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Brigadier General John Olson, Chief Data and Artificial Intelligence Officer for the Department of the Air Force. General Olson, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you very much, Summer. It's a pleasure to be here. So what inspired you to pursue a career in the Air Force, and how has your journey been as you've climbed the ranks over the years? Well, that's a great question. You know, it started when I was just a very young little boy, and I always wanted to be an astronaut. I, I, uh, I was born in 1969, and so I saw, uh, I, I saw the tremendous impact that the uh, landings on the moon had on our nation. And so that really drove uh, everything that I, uh, I set out to do in my life. And, and, and that propelled me through school and training. And uh, I went to the Air Force Academy in order to uh, pursue that dream. And so that really launched my career into the Air Force. After graduating, I went to grad school to further build my competitiveness, to, 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 to be an astronaut and pursue a career uh, in air and space and engineering and high tech. And so that really uh, was the nascent start. And after uh, serving in the Air Force in 2004, I left and departed and, and went to NASA and became an Air Force Reserve officer, but served at NASA uh, for 10 years. Six of those, I was a senior executive servant at NASA. Uh, my last two years, I went to the Office of Science and Technology Policy or OSTP at the White House and I uh, got to serve as the Assistant Director for Space and Aeronautics. So oversaw the, the, the entire air and space portfolio for the United States. And then after doing that uh, for, for a couple of years, I left and went to industry where I started at Sierra Nevada Corporation, the largest woman-owned privately held aerospace and defense contractor. I uh, worked there for three and a half years as both uh, Vice President of Space Exploration Systems and then the Senior Vice President of uh, Washington operations. Then I left and got to got to go back to uh, the home, uh, the homeland, uh, Minneapolis. That worked for Polaris for four years as vice president and general manager of commercial government defense. So, since Polaris is a Fortune 500 uh, public company, it was an extraordinary experience to build uh, a further repertoire. And then I left there and became the CEO of a uh, multi-sector, six-sector. A multi-billion dollar company, a private company working in the uh, medical data, the health data, uh, data, cybersecurity, energy, secure transportation and finance sector. So uh, upon uh, upon uh, appointment here to be uh, General Raymond's uh, mobilization assistant or the mobilization assistant to the chief of space operations for the Space Force, I uh, I resigned that position in order to be full time as an active duty uh, reserve officer here supporting this critically important time in our nation's evolution. The first time we have a new service in in 75 years. And so it's really been an exciting journey along the way. I've also become the Space Force lead for Joint All Domain Command and Control and Advanced Battle Management System. I know those are a, mouth, a mouthful, but JADC2 and ABMS are essentially the ability to sense, make sense, and act across the, the joint services in multi-domain environments in a, in, in a challenging environment. So uh, that's been another key role that I think has dovetailed well uh, and, and, and married well with the Space Force activities. And then since the 1st of January uh, for this one year, I'm the first Department of the Air Force, which includes both the Air and Space Force, I'm the first DAF. Uh, chief data and AI officer. So it's been an incredible ride because data and artificial intelligence are at the core of everything that we do. In fact, I think people and data are the most important uh, strategic assets that we have. So it's really been quite a journey. And and and, and as I look back and reflect uh, from those very beginnings, um, they may sound like disparate or disaggregated or, or, or somewhat segregated uh, areas, but they're really absolutely intertwined and very synergistic and interdependent. So uh, it's it's been a good uh, it's been a good journey, and I think bringing that multi multitude of interagency and and uh, industry experience made me a much better government person. And and, and similarly, I think I was a much better government or, or, or industry person because of that government experience. So it's been it's it's been great, and of course, my wife. Uh, is a saint and 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 has enabled so very much 
of, 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 of this career trajectory. And what advice would you give to someone looking to tap into your industry today? Well, you know, I, I haven't really been in one single industry, but I, I think collectively, uh, as, as, as kind of outlined for those, I, I, I would say the five C's are very, uh, are very appropriate. Collaboration is, is critical. Uh, it's, it's essential to everything that we do in a modern interconnected uh, environment. So too is cooperation and collaboration and cooperation are different. And I think uh, cooperate and graduate is a core tenet of, of, of success in, 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 in a world where uh, often the innovation and the boundary spanning breakthroughs uh, come from cooperation across groups that could be government and industry and academia and international partners and allies. And so uh, I think the, the, third, the third C of the five is communication. Um, commit, uh, com communication and regu regular and succinct and clear and concise uh, communication is so vitally important to both uh, up and down and, 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 and laterally and across our networks. And so I think that's been a, 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 you know, a, a, a big way in, in, in communicating uh, is, 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 is the best way to, to insert or inject into this uh, exciting ecosystem that we're playing in. And then, and then uh, combined learning, I think, uh, combined continual learning. And, and, and by that, I mean, uh, experiential and 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 uh, and formal education, as well as uh, a zest for for continued lifelong learning. Because I think as we see the rate and pace of technology change, as the organizational uh, and cultural uh, dynamics are are, are are ever present, I think it's vitally important that we become really focused and committed to a lifelong uh, learning journey, and that can be a lot of fun. Uh, particularly with the modern tools uh, that enable such uh, great virtual uh, and, and, and hybridized learning. And finally, I would say it's a, a comprehensive vision, having a, having a strong view uh, for, for, for the future, but living for the day and driving. Uh, and, I, and I think that as one looks to enter into uh, these set of industries, I think it's really important to stay abreast of the latest trends and opportunities to seek to uh, add value and differentiate yourself uh, from uh, from the broad field. And I think by focusing on these five C's and bringing those all to a critical focus, uh, I think it's a great way to insert. But, uh, you know, it is vitally important as we look at an economy and our national security and our health security. They're all based upon science, technology, engineering and math or the STEM disciplines. Uh, and certainly that underpins. But I, I'm a big fan of STEAM throwing the arts in a and, and, and a broader background in uh, in, in, in a broad, uh, broad based liberal arts education and continuing uh, worldview, because I think as we look at uh, the increasing uh, smallness of the world and the interconnectedness, that's that's vitally important. Sir, what can you tell us about the Air Force's digital transformation? What progress has been made thus far and where are some of the remaining gaps? Well, I, I appreciate the question, and I, I would actually broaden it to not just focus on the Air Force, since, since I'm General Raymond's uh, mobilization assistant to the Chief of Space Operations. What I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the Space Force first, and then I'll broaden that to the Department of the Air Force, or the DAF, uh, which, will, uh, which will fully you know, characterize and, 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 ex and expand the question. So for the Space Force, um, as the first service born digital, it is really focused on being interconnected, innovative, and a digitally dominant force. And, and you know, so what does that really mean? I mean, we have to be able to efficiently and effectively share relevant information across a very vast and broad range of stakeholders. And we got to do that at the speed of need. And it's so it's, you know, it's people based, it's infrastructure based. And I think what's really important about that is it drives a cultural change. And that cultural change must first start and be underpinned by a digitally savvy workforce. And, 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 and again, we talked about that lifelong zeal or zest for learning. It's super important that we take that uh, same uh, perspective and, 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 and bring it to bear on, on, on this digitally uh, savvy workforce. And, and, and within the Space Force, uh, the, whole, the sole purpose, the raison d'etre, of driving a, a, a digital service or digital force 
is to accelerate the, 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 the rate and change and pace and adoption of innovation. And that's not innovation just for the heck of it. It's focused on mission success and capability and deterrence and achieving our primary objective, which is to provide, uh, uh, protect and defend uh, U.S. and allied interests in space. So from that perspective, it's very, very important. And, and so uh, as we look at it within the Space Force, we really have four key thrusts that we focus on. We focus on a digital engineering ecosystem as the first side, and that underpins everything that we do from digital twins and digital model-based systems engineering throughout all the phases of the development, test, and, and, and operations and sustainment. And so it's a total digital thread uh, that, that allows us to have the agility and it allows us to have uh, the responsiveness that we need to evolve at the rate and pace of not only our challengers and competitors, but also the rate and pace of technology so that we can lead and maintain a first mover advantage as well as a strategic, uh, a strategic role in, 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 in global affairs. The second part is a digital headquarters, and we're, we're, we're taking that to mean everything from our planning, programming, and budgeting, and execution through our, the way that we operate from requirements through, uh, through execution, the way w- that we handle our, 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 our timely actions and taskers, as well as uh, all, of our, uh, all of our workforce and key personnel activities. And that ties into the third uh, element, which is a digital workforce, as we talked about having a digital savvy service, uh, having a, a digital fluency, uh, a continuous training mindset. And so we're really driving the use of digital university as well as our super coders and other tools. And as we go forward, I think it's really important to also uh, focus on that fourth and final leg and that's digital operations. Everything that we do since we are focused on mission operations and, and a safe and effective and a resilient uh, architecture and an and operational uh, posture. That is exactly uh, what we're trying to do in, in, in leveraging those four areas. So that's the Space Force writ large. And as uh, General Raymond released the vision for a digital service uh, on, in May of 2021, we're a year plus into that. And it's really all about implementation and doing so at, at, at a scale and a scope and a, and, a, and a level of penetration that's absolutely uh, across the entire enterprise. And as we look at the, the Space Force as one of the two services within the Department of the Air Force, I think what's really helpful here is as we look at, uh, as we look at the Department of the Air Force, we've got $194 billion budget, $24.5 billion uh, in the space side, $169 billion in the, in, in the Air Force side. As we look at the important enabling uh, elements provided by enterprise IT, a digital savvy workforce, uh, data and operationaliz- operationalization of data and AI ML readiness, plus analytics that drive data-driven decisions and decision advantage and information advantage. Collectively, these are the way that we need to prepare and, and deliver integrated deterrence and defense and warfighting capability with business enterprise efficiency across the enterprise. So that's how it all comes to play. Today uh, marks the, 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 the beginning or the first day debut of the OSD or the Oper- Office of Secretary of Defense uh, Chief Digital and AI Office or the CDAO. And since I run the DAF CDAO, which is a different acronym, it's the Chief Data and AI Office, but they're still very much uh, aligned. And, and at the DAF level, we implement and amplify those uh, broader DOD elements. So that's how it all stitches together. And we're working to deliver great value for the nation, for the taxpayer, pack, taxpayer but it's all a team sport. And so um, we underpin it with that digital revolution and the digital capabilities that after all, we're 22 and a half years into the 21st century information age. And this is absolutely where we need to be. But we know that partnering with industry is the place to be because The ecosystem, the rate and pace of change, the investment climate, and the codependence that we have together, because after all, we are in this uh, whole of nation ecosystem. I think that's what it's going to take to succeed. So thanks very much for the question. General Olson, you mentioned the Department of the Air Force's North Star vision is operationalizing data and improving AI ML readiness. 
As the first chief data and AI officer, what are you doing towards that vision today? What are some of the hurdles and where can industry step in to help? Well, I think the first and most important uh, action to achieve uh, strategic success is, is setting a bold vision and an action plan and strategy with objectives and goals and milestones to achieve it. And so as we look at the Department of the Air Force and as we look at this historic time where we've now got data in AI ML together, which absolutely makes total sense because 80 to 85 percent of AI ML readiness is is, is data formatting, data metadata tagging, data cleansing, data wrangling, if, if, if you will, uh, validating data integrity. It's a whole litany of elements and it's, and, and it's really uh, challenging and, 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 and difficult work, but it's so vitally important to a- enable the, the, the AI ML uh, applications that we need to harness to move at the speed of need and, 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 and really deliver the results that we seek. But as we look at this as a historic opportunity, you know, as I've said before, people and data are our most strategic assets. And as we look at data, it's so vitally important uh, to, 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 to harness it, make it accessible and visible. Uh, what we call those the Voltus attributes, you know, visible, accessible, understandable, linked, trustworthy, interoperable and secure. And each one of those is its own litany of, of actions and, and, and requirements. But collectively, uh, they lead us. Uh, they lead us to a level of utility, uh, and and the, and those, those those data attributes are essential for for the work that we're doing. But you know, as we look at this, as as we look at this historic opportunity, um, setting a vision to operationalize data and to uh, bring AI ML readiness uh, such to to bear such that we have AI readiness by 2025 and AI competitiveness by 2027, all of which are set by real world uh, competitive benchmarking in order to be world class uh, in these domains, which are so essential to our mission success. That's simply what it takes. And so by setting out that bold vision, we've also throughout our senior leadership across the Department of the Air Force, and that's from the Secretary of the Air Force uh, and the Undersecretary through uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, uh, General Brown, and Chief of Space Operations, General Raymond. Together, we set data and AI ML readiness as foundational elements, critical things uh, necessary, must pay bills, if you will, priorities. Uh, and so these are uh, these are these are the elements that we're we're driving this, and 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 what are we hoping to achieve? Well, they're they're really threefold with operationalization of data and AIML readiness. The first is to increase business enterprise efficiency, and we've laid out a, a, a goal there of thirty percent. And this sounds pretty bold and audacious, and it indeed underscores the importance and criticality and the transformative effect of of this. And in this time of fiscally constrained environment. These are exactly the kind of leap or breakthrough uh, capabilities. And, and, and as the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence for the United States uh, so well documented in the report, which we use as a big driver for both uh, our national uh, efforts as well as within the Department of the Air Force and the Department of Defense, this is, this, this is the, 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 the fuel that powers everything. And yet, you know, I like to say data is really like the, you know, it's not the new oil or the new uh, gold. It's far more precious than that. It's like the new plutonium in that it needs to be processed and rich, but boy, it can power the future. It can power everything that we do, but it is very precious commodity. And so um, driving that increased business enterprise efficiency, but then that business enterprise exists for two reasons, for missions operations capability. So we want to increase that by 25%, as well as increasing our warfighting capacity. So as the very last resort, when integrated deterrence and defense fail, we got to have a warfighting capacity to, again, protect and defend the interests of the United States and its allies and partners. And so we think we can double our warfighting capacity uh, with the, with this capability. And these are these are actually, if we truly harness the full potency and potential of AI and, and, and data as a strategic asset and, 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 and do so as part of a strategic imperative, well, then we can truly unleash the power. And it is 
the disruptive element of the 21st century. And so uh, as it's a global competition, our, 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 our peer and near peer adversaries and competitors are certainly doing the same. They're investing, they're being very bold and aggressive, and we aim to do it smarter and better, but building and underpinning that on the diversity and richness of the industrial base and, 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 and academic ecosystem. So really a whole of nation approach, but also building upon the innovative and entrepreneurial spirit of the American public and the American business ecosystem. And then it is also driving a passion and a, and a, and a creativity uh, level of engagement and, and, and bringing that to bear on this problem. So we think that that whole of government approach, that unified approach will deliver the results that will get us to where we need to be. And certainly the civil military fusion and command direction of some of those uh, other countries I mentioned, uh, I think that's potent, but it can't hold a candle to the combined whole of government integrated approach based upon diversity, innovation, entrepreneurial system, a robust and dynamic and 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 uh, vibrant U.S. industrial base and harnessing the creativity uh, that we can bring to bear. So I think that's the solution there. What do we have to do and how can how can industry help? Well, certainly uh, it's, it, as, as I mentioned before, the, the Department of Defense and, and indeed the federal government is no longer the nexus of the most, uh, of, of the most uh, large and robust uh, research and development enterprise. Certainly, we want to be able to purchase commercial goods and services and partner uh, with commercial industry and academia to, to, you know, wherever possible. And only where necessary do we want to build those uh, inherently governmental or organic systems. And so really, that's that's the new paradigm. That's the paradigm which we're trying to do through uh, smart and accelerated acquisition, through smart and innovative uh, public-private partnerships, through enabling contracts, through enabling legislation and policies and programs, all the way from bridging the valley of death, which I think is something that we hear loud and clear from uh, industry, through uh, creating more ease of opportunities and, and, and getting rid of some of the government red tape and bureaucracy and streamlining that ability to honor it, particularly with new starts or people who haven't worked with the government in the past. I think that's the key to the future. And so whether it's a large, medium or small business, whether it's a new or uh, a, a traditional stalwart, we want to enable that entire enterprise ecosystem because Together, again, we'll cooperate and graduate, and mission success depends on it. I think the whole of nation approach that I mentioned earlier is only possible by being smart and, and, and listening first, and then being quick to react and respond with, uh, with, with bold and, and uh, uh, vigorous applications. General Olson, you wear many hats, and one of them is as the Space Force lead for JADC2 and the Advanced Battle Management System. Can you give us an update on ABMS? What's on the horizon for the program now that the Defense Department's JADC2 implementation has begun? Well, thank you. That That is indeed a big question. Frankly, JADC2, or Joint All Domain Command and Control, which is the ability to sense, make sense, and act across all the joint services in a multi-domain environment, so that's air, sea, land, space, and cyber, and doing so in a contested or challenged environment against thinking smart, well-resourced peer adversaries. That is the challenge that is JADC2. And of course, uh, the Department of the Air Force, both the Air and Space Force, have the Advanced Battle Management System, which is ABMS, and that is the primary contribution of the partner of the Air Force to JADC2. And so as we look at that, it's really uh, in collaboration, the Navy, the Department of the Navy, uh, I should say, which includes both the Navy and the Marine Corps, has Overmatch, Project Overmatch. And then for the Army, it's Project Convergence. And so together, those three elements form uh, the service contributions to JADC2. But JADC2, as I mentioned, that ability to sense, make sense, and, and, and act at the speed of need is really a tough uh, challenge. One, it, it, is, it is bringing together such a broad uh, set of operational attributes from sensors to effectors and, and, and the ability to make with machine speed, since machine to machine speed is required, 
to operate with the observe, orient, decide, act, or the OODA loop, or the kill chain, or uh, we, you know, executing actions at the speed of need, it often requires um, much more than just uh, technical solutions. Certainly, those are an integral part in machine-to-machine -machine engagement, which leverages, again, data and AI ML readiness. That's so vital to the success of JADC2 and EBMS. But it is also a, a, a much broader set of cultural and training and doctrine and material solutions. So the dot mill PFP um, uh, types of solutions. But quite frankly, as we look at JADC2 and EBMS, one of the things uh, that is that, that is nice is now with the uh, the, the DODs um, publishing and signature of the JADC2 implementation plan that lays out the broad roadmap allows both industry and academia, as well as all the elements at Echelon throughout the joint services to really see the big, broad game plan, identi and identify and, and, and associate and see where you can fit in and contribute in terms of those, those, uh, those implementation level uh, details. And, and, and yet, I would also proffer that even though we have the JADC2 reference architecture 3.0 and we're working on uh, the reference design uh, I think they're still way too. I, I think they're still way too uh, ambiguous. If I'm blunt about that, we need to drive towards more specificity. We hear that loud and clear. We're doing that at the service levels, but I think you know it, it requires a, a systems level in, of, of integration. And of course, uh, you know my PhD is in industrial and systems engineer, so I'm I, I'm a systems thinker by by you know by by training, but I believe that if we look at this macro system of systems problem, breaking it down into bite-sized manageable pieces and strategically and tactically and operationally looking at each one of these elements, we're already starting to see that between the Department of the Air Force and the Department of Navy, for one example, we're seeing incredible, uh, incredible fruitful discussions come out of uh, greater discussions, talking about common principles, uh, where we can cooperate and graduate and leverage each other's capabilities. It saves time and money and integration uh, elements, but we've got so much more to do. And, and so we're at a very nascent stage, but at the same time, the sense of the imperative is upon us all. We got to, this, this is the, the future of joint, uh, the joint war fighting uh, concept and construct or the uh, JWC. And, and this is how the joint services will protect and defend the United States of America with our partners and allies. And I think that's a key part of this is our partners and allies play such an integral role. And we've seen that in current conflict and we see that uh, and expect that certainly in the future. It's so vitally important. So what we're trying to do is make sure with the multi levels of classification, with the digital infrastructure that is underpinning all of this, because, it, it, you know, it's it's data centric. It's moving data at the speed of need in that contested environment among the joint services. And we know that interoperability driver is huge. So we need things like zero trust and identity and credential, uh, ICAM, identity and credential and access management. We also need to have uh, a, a, a common foundational uh, level of engagement with, uh, with, with, with uh, secure DevSecOps environments, with Kubernetes and, and containerization and, and, and cybersecurity built in and baked in in every aspect throughout. So I think this is a fundamentally important part. We also need to look as we look at the algorithms, you know, algorithmic security, responsible artificial intelligence, looking at the ethical applications throughout, making sure it's responsible and ethical and, 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 and transparent and, and, and reliable and governable. Those are the, the five tenets of, 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 of responsible AI. We also make sure that our training data is, is secured and protected so that when we do have um, uh, artificial intelligence in widespread application throughout the, uh, the elements, we have uh, the appropriate safeguards and in, in, in the visibility in, but we also have uh, throughout the, 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 the life cycle uh, made sure we've, we, we've done good stewardship. So I think it's an ecosystem approach. And I'll get right back to what I said earlier this is where industry and academia are going to be essential because that's, again, where the strength and the nexus and the concentration of our greatest capability sets are. We simply don't have enough people 
in wearing either uh, a, a, a uniform or as government civilians um, or, 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 or even as government contractors, we need to leverage the full strength of the industrial base and the academia base of not only the United States, but our key partners and allies. And together we can get this done. It is vitally important that we pull on this entire ecosystem and community. And so um, I'm really excited about the, 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 the horizon ahead. As we look at advanced battle management system, we recently briefed the JADC2 and ABMS, what's called the Secretary of the Air Force's operational imperatives. There were seven of them, and JADC2 and ABMS were OI, or operational imperative number two, and it really links with all the other ones. And so these are the most important priorities for the Secretary of the Air Force. And as we roll in and resource those, and as we start and underpin with that digital infrastructure and all the other elements that I mentioned at first, it is vitally important that we leverage, again, industry to succeed here. And so uh, a lot more coming. Uh, the budget priorities are there. Uh, the mission imperatives are there. And now what we need to do is, 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 is pair up and get her done together. So this is really an exciting time, whether it be in data and AI or whether it's with space and the resilient and effective architectures that we're building, or whether it's the, the energy and applications that we're doing to innovate for sustainability and prosperity, or whether it's uh, our, 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 our broader uh, focus on delivering best value for the nation through integrated deterrence. And, and it, is, it is truly an exciting time in our nation's history. And I appreciate the opportunity to share with you and your viewers, because I think as we look at Executive Mosaic and we look at that continuous learning and that networking and that engagement back to the five C's where we have collaboration, cooperation, communication, continual learning and, and a comprehensive vision. It's forums like this that allow us to share and team and partner and challenge and passionately convey um, uh, the potential solutions to our toughest challenges. So I really have enjoyed speaking with you, Summer, and I Look forward to engaging with this very important uh, set of awesome friends and colleagues ahead. General Olson, thank you so much for joining us today and for all the work you do at the Department of the Air Force. Well, it's a pleasure and I wish you the very best as well. Good luck and Godspeed. Hello and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Maya and here to speak with me today is Rob Carey, President of Cloudera Government Solutions. Rob, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So we're seeing a major trend in the government towards data centricity. Can you give us an overview of the public sector's data journey in recent years? Uh, it, good question. It, it's sort of the summary um, summer of, of data when I was a CIO was a problem to worry about standards and the actual specific uh, elements of uh, data that then flew into tables that then created, you know, opportunities to align within big uh, ERPs, things like that. So we were worried about the micro and not necessarily the macro. And the macro being, can the agencies deliver decisions and, and make intelligent informed decisions from this plethora of data that they have from these systems and endpoints and what have you. And so the journey has come in the last, let's say 10 years, from data as a micro resource solving tactical problems to, to data at a macro level that can solve problems at the enterprise scale. So standards are now simplified because there are tools that enable the organizations to ingest data from wherever it happens to be, put it into a, a data lake, data lake house, what have you, run analytics on it, and then derive answers out the other side much more easily and quickly than was able to be done 10 years ago, right? So, so there's been a tremendous movement in the ability to actually manage and utilize data as a strategic asset in the last 10 years. Rob, you mentioned data is often coming from multiple different sources and agencies need to really locate and understand it in order to use it properly. What are some of the key challenges and opportunities you're seeing emerge as agencies try to harness this data in motion and use it to drive decisions? So uh, another good question. So, you know, data, all of our computers at any place on the network create log files, create uh, data. 
applications produce data, um, and then it gets stored in a database, which may be sitting in a legacy data center, now maybe in the cloud. So, so now to, to take a holistic view of this data and to be able to make use out of it, use it to render decisions, you have to bring it somewhere. You can't, you can't just leave it where it sits. So, so the ingestion of this data to a central location to then allow it to be mined and examined and analyzed, uh, maybe with AI, ML, what have you, is really what has to happen, right? And so I think agencies are recognizing that now. As a matter of fact, I know they are. Uh, the question is, okay, prioritize where you want to connect your data. I'll use the example of cybersecurity, right? So if all the endpoints in an agency, all the laptops and desktops are producing log files, which are very interesting to people in the security operations center, Okay, so now if I move that data into a central location and I can process it before I hand it to the cybersecurity stack, I've enabled the cybersecurity stack to, to perform better uh, than it had if it just ingested the data itself because they are not set up. Those tools do this, but maybe not as well and at scale, at the scale that the big data platforms can do it. So the ability to then harness the movement, right, and determine you don't want to have to worry about where the data is. You don't want to have to worry about its format. You want to worry about, I know where it is. I can move it into a place. I can enrich it once it's in a central location. And then I can decide what I want to do with it once it's there. So you mentioned cybersecurity as a big part of this conversation. What role can cloud play in the federal government's data strategy? Well, uh, you know, cloud has been around since Vivek Kundra announced cloud first policy 12 years ago. So, so it does provide a powerful engine for both storage and compute, but it has to meet, you know, in our, in federal space, FedRAMP standards, which is fine, you know, cause the security is important, uh, highly important that we, we are at least as secure as the government networks are being managed uh, uh, inside their fence line, if you will, inside their firewall. So at the end of the day, um, to be able to harness this data that exists in cloud along with your data centers, you know, sort of have the, you have this hybrid data architecture, right? So you have, everybody's not on one cloud, everybody's not on cloud. So you're staring at the problem and going as a CIO or a CDO and you say, my data is where it is, okay? So the role that cloud plays is an important flexibility capability for that agency to scale up and scale down storage and compute as required, and then also enable access from a lot of, a lot more locations than is maybe accessible for legacy on-prem guys. So, so cloud plays a role that enables the right applications and the right data to sit in that, that flexible storage compute and keeps the cost where you want it because everything doesn't need to be in the cloud, right? You actually have to do the business case to determine what goes and what doesn't go. And then, and that's why data tools have to be able to span both uh, legacy and cloud locations to then create the holistic picture for management to then decide what they want to do. And Rob, you previously served as principal deputy CIO for the Department of Defense, and you oversaw the first cloud strategy. Since your time in government, what strides have you seen in how the federal government harnesses cloud and what do you see for the future of cloud? Oh, I, I, it's, it's an amazing transformation. Um, cloud has provided the basis of digital transformation of the federal government. Um, it, it, had that not come along, uh, we would be paying for legacy data centers. We would be paying a lot of money when certain programs required a flexibility to go up or, or go down, um, it would be an expensive proposition to have legacy do that. So, so cloud has been that fundamental change agent in, in government. Now, as big as government is, and, and so here we are uh, uh, 12 years later, since that edict of everybody go to cloud, and we have FedRAMP, so now we have rules of the road, right? Which are which are a little tedious to deal with, but they're very valuable because we have to keep security at our forefront. We don't want to bake it in after the fact. We want to build it in uh, from the get go. So, so cloud has brought opportunity to the government to um, utilize data in a different manner than it was able to be utilized in the past. So. 
the the ability to store and compute in locations that you don't care about that you have now coop capabilities right you have backups that you didn't have before um, there's many many attributes that cloud has brought to the table when i look at uh, where the department of defense was with jedi like they were going to let a 10 billion dollar contract for cloud compute workloads in that department now jwcc is coming and they will do the same thing so that they've, they've got to find a way to get themselves to make use of it where it is appropriate and then there's places where it's not necessarily appropriate right so so now you have this tool that you can use as you see fit to then continue your digital transformation and continue the acceleration of uh, services to citizens and services to mission excellent and Rob, lastly, what advice would you give someone entering your industry today? To focus on mission, right? You're, you're, when I came to, to industry um, a little while back, uh, it's really important to understand you're here. We, as a uh, industry member, are here to serve the government and to help their problems go away and help them get better. If we are successful at doing that, you will make money, you will make sales. If you are not successful at doing that, similarly, you will not, right? So, so the focus on the mission of the government agency that you're trying to support is really utmost and important. The second thing that I would bring in is to be patient, right? The government is working as fast as it knows how to work. And, and so sometimes we think that decisions can be made in, in seconds, and, and that's not the case, right? It's a complicated world. Money is appropriate by the Congress. The Congress gets the money to the individual agencies. And then, of course, lots of machinations occur on that. So, so patience is an actual virtue. And then, obviously, the last thing is, uh, that I would say is lead, do not manage, right? When you, when you look at the government, the government is looking for help being successful at its job. They're not interested in your quarterly uh, 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 attainment uh, metrics. They're not interested in your sales numbers. They're interested in things that solve their problems for a fair price, and then they will do it. So, so leading is much more important than managing. You know, you're, you want, when you start to lead, you realize hey, I know what their problem is, I know how to solve it, and now I'm going to offer them opportunities to use my software to sell or to solve their problem, period. And if it does, right, it stands a good chance of being bought and then implemented, and now, you, now you're partnered with them to make them successful. So focus on mission, be patient, and lead. Well, Rob, thank you for sharing your insights today and for all the work you do at Cloudera. Thanks, Summer. Appreciate it. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Jill Singer, Vice President of Defense and National Security for AT&T Public Sector and FirstNet. Jill, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, good morning, Summer. Thank you for the invitation. I look forward to today's session. So Jill, as you know, communications and robust networks are huge priorities right now for the federal government. We're seeing this with the JADC2 rollout, and we're even seeing this overseas in Ukraine. What are some of the big trends you're seeing in industry as the government pursues more advanced communications capabilities? Yeah, great question. Um, I think I see four trends, and I'll try to cover them very quickly. So the first trend we see is wireless networks. For mission users, the line between a wired or a fixed network and a wireless connection is really blurring. We have to meet the mission where it is, and that means sometimes a fixed environment, like a building or a semi-permanent location. Other times it means a mobile environment, something non-permanent or a movable location. And delivering a robust mission user experience across traditional networks and mobile networks is critical to current and future success. So the second trend we see is 5G. 5G is more than just the next generation of wireless network networking. The power and security of 5G is really a radical uplift for all of us, where the speed behind 5G gives the user a wired network experience. 5G allows untethered access and processing of large volumes of data. It provides a world-class experience wherever your device has a 5G access. And when you combine 5G with multi-access edge computing, it's a mouthful, so we call it MEC for short. It really feels like the mission or the citizen has a cloud 
right there in their phone or their tablet. It combines major computing power with end user access to fuel very demanding missions with a real time capability. So let me hit two other trends really quickly. Um, the third trend is software defined networking. Um, government has significant investments in legacy network environments, uh, wired environments that span the country and the globe. It's really time consuming to run around the world and update legacy equipment. The transition can take years uh, for some agencies and equipment struggles to keep pace with end user demands. And as soon as you've patched it, the equipment now is vulnerable to the next cybersecurity breach. So we can fix all that with software defined networking where you can take control of your investments and you can quickly deliver new capabilities or improvements or patches or updates and you don't have to touch the individual piece of hardware. We think it makes your environment more agile more scalable and more efficient, especially for government. The fourth trend that we see is a persistent and relentless focus on cybersecurity. That will be no surprise to anyone. It remains the number one priority for government agencies. So protecting mission data and citizen data does require a multi-pronged approach. Um, many people call it a zero trust architecture. And your network, we believe, is the critical link to achieving this zero trust architecture. And when you're deploying wired and wireless networks with enhanced cybersecurity features, it is a paramount element to countering cyber intrusions. Thank you. And Jill, you recently said we're seeing a shift occur in how the government procures and manages networks. Can you elaborate a little bit on what's going on with uh, government network procurement right now? Yeah, I'd be happy to elaborate on what we're seeing in uh, government procurement of networks. They're complicated environments. Networks really are just complicated environments, and they do require continuously evolving skills to ensure that the mission demands um, and the security of the network are both top notch. Agencies are increasingly interested in procuring full lifecycle managed network services, where industry partners like AT&T operate and manage their networks for today and for tomorrow. Buying a managed network service allows the agency to redeploy its in-house IT expertise directly against areas that they believe are higher value for their missions. Uh, and instead of deploying their precious people on network maintenance or operations or upgrade tasks, they can use them in other ways that they believe are the most effective for achieving their mission goals. I think managed network services also allows government to make a shift from buying labor or people to actually buying performance based outcomes where they can dictate the outcomes. Maybe it's the service levels, maybe it's the quality of service or whatever the outcomes are, which are important to their mission. They can buy this. They can buy a network in that manner as opposed to buying it by a person or a group of people. We think this actually will help the government keep pace with technology advances while improving optimal performance and, again, helping with their cybersecurity posture. So earlier you talked about 5G, and in that area we're already seeing 6G and what people are calling <laughs> next G emerge. What's on the horizon for 5G and its future iterations in the intelligence community? Um, you're right. 5G is here. We're already working on 6G, and I think next G is probably the right way to say it. Um, in the intelligence community, they're really looking carefully at 5G. Um, they've been actively seeking advice and education about how 5G networking can actually benefit their mission. They have some unique aspects, though. Um, and they have several concerns with wireless technologies in general, and 5G is no exception to their concerns. And we have to be able to solve their, uh, their concerns and prove on the security aspects that we say are there, prove to the intelligence community that they are there. Uh, and that's all because they have really highly sensitive work that they do, and they cannot afford any exfiltration of their information. Um, for example, if you uh, don't spend a lot of time in the intelligence community, they use wireless intrusion detection services to um, to wirelessly and quietly detect if there is actually a mobile device in their spaces. And if they find a mobile device, 
then the next thing they're going to do is look for the holder of that mobile device. And that actually is a security violation in most cases. Regardless of all those concerns, we are seeing increased interest for private 5G networks. These would deliver 5G across a campus environment without allowing access to standard commercial 5G networks, for example. This is just one example. Uh, we believe that private 5G could actually give the agency enhanced control and security uh, while allowing their users a higher performing wireless experience. And I probably should say, and a safer wireless experience. We've got work to do uh, for 5G and wireless technologies in the intelligence community. I would say that the members of the intelligence community right now are in the learning, testing, and experimenting phases with 5G. Ultimately, we expect they will adopt 5G or next G or 6G, whatever it is, as they gain more confidence and a deeper understanding. This is repetitive, but especially where cybersecurity is concerned. So now more than ever, military services are requiring connection at the edge. What advancements do you hope to see in areas like Internet of Things? You know, I would tell you that innovating at the tactical edge is pretty exciting these days, and that includes things like the Internet of Things. We are working with DOD in a variety of ways to help them explore and innovate with 5G, edge computing, IoT, smart fleet, and many other capabilities. We uh, recently participated in a Navy demonstration at uh, Naval Base Coronado in California, where we actually showcased a variety of AT&T 5G powered technology solutions um, in support of the Navy's work on smart warehouse. Our private 5G network at the base delivered data throughput speeds of 3.9 gigabits per second and less than 10 milliseconds of latency when we were powering these demonstrations. That really is a wired network-like speed uh, and a wired network-like latency. Some of the use cases that we worked on uh, were a 5G-enabled virtual reality slash augmented reality capabilities to support military training and operations. We also worked on 5G-powered high-definition video surveillance. Uh, we worked on artificial intelligence and machine learning use cases that use the AT&T 5G in a cloud environment. And we did 5G-enabled augmented reality to support advanced put-and-pick technology operated with a hands-free mobile device. We hope to expand our work with the Department of Defense as they explore the benefits of commercial and private 5G networks. Some areas where we need to see some more advancement include device and sensor security. Um, the, the network has to be very secure, but the things you use to attach to the network also have to be very secure. In summary, we really want to be a part of the solution in helping DOD surmount logistical and technical hurdles to more widespread adoption of 5G networking to power advanced IoT and lots of other technologies as well. And Jill, what advice do you have to somebody entering the industry today? Well, it's a pretty exciting industry to enter into, so maybe I'll take it from a couple perspectives. Um, if you are associated with technology, I think my first piece of advice would be about education. Uh, new entrants into telecommunications or technology industry in general, and particularly for government customers, they really need to be current on technology. Uh, the currency means a commitment to continuous learning because the technology, as we all know, either as users or as business professionals or government, it's uh, it the pace is difficult to keep up with. Um, the changes in the existing technology happen fast, and also understanding what's going on with emerging technology is really important. So the first advice I'd say is be committed to your ongoing education where technology is concerned. Um, I would also say that when you uh, serve the federal government through a technology lens, whether that's as a government employee or as a contractor to the government, it's really important to me personally that you have a true sense of pride uh, in the U.S. government and in its work and in its missions. 
Um, I've seen how a shared sense of mission, which we deeply share with our customers, uh, for the betterment of citizens and freedoms, both here and abroad, can really translate into a very specific sense of purpose. It's a purpose that, for me in my career, one that guides your ambition to perform at the very highest levels for the customers and the missions you serve. Um, if you're thinking of going into government, and certainly that's where I spent the, the first part of my career, I would tell new entrants in technology and into the government, do some homework. There are lots of government departments and agencies and services that you can join. And if you have your site set on just one, that might be a little too narrow. So pick three or five agencies or missions that really excite you and search for that job like you would any other job. Uh, put your resume out there. Apply for multiple jobs in those three to five agencies that really excite you and have a wider aperture uh, so that you have a greater opportunity of being selected. Um, this also might apply if you're in the contractor side of government where uh, on our side as contractors, we also serve many missions. And so there are many opportunities for someone who wants to come into the space and combine their technology acumen with a sense of government service. Well, thank you, Jill, for your participation today and for all the work you do at AT&T. Thanks, Summer. It's a pleasure. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Terry Ryan, CEO of Constellus. Terry, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. So Constellus is in the business of protection, security, and risk management. Can you give us an overview of the threat landscape and what are some of the notable trends you're seeing emerge in this space? Yeah, I, I think both the way we look at it, both domestically and internationally, there's um, three, there's a few ways to characterize that threat. Um, first is the natural, you know, natural disasters, natural causes. Um, the weather has been so extreme um, for all the locations that we provide support, both internationally and domestic, that our critical infrastructure is just not prepared um, to deal with these natural disasters at these kind of levels. So we're on constant vigilance, you know, trying to figure out from a contingency standpoint what happens to power, what happens to roads that lead into these infrastructure. So we're mindful of that, and we have to be, you know, assessing that in, in our risk profile. And then the other ones are just the, the next level of threats are just the human cost. I mean, I don't think anybody would debate this political extremism, both domestically and internationally, is causing all kinds of threats. I mean, people just don't have an appreciation for um, just the high level of security that's required in a lot of these facilities that we protect. Uh, just and, and people just have lost sight of um, what's theirs and what's not. I mean, uh, what we hear these reports of on any given hour, there's like 23,000 shoplifting events just here in the United States. I mean, it's a four to $6 billion a year problem. People have no respect for property any longer. Um, and so also when we think about human cause threats, we also got to think about the insider threat. Um, and so again, it's back to that trust. Um, and the background investigation business for us is a growing business. Um, and so many companies are worried about the protection of their data. So also human caused is just cyber, the cyber, number of cyber attacks. So ransomware. Um, the uh, FBI reported, you know, over 2,500 serious ransomware issues last year. Um, the convergence of cyber and physical security is something that's very important to us. And then lastly, there's that accidental type of threat. And so are you, do you have enough people and are those people trained well enough to prevent some kind of accident, whether it's water purification, um, whatever it might be at a facility, um, are we prepared from a risk management standpoint to mitigate those accidental threats? And like you said, as new threats emerge, protection is needed not only for physical assets, but digital as well. How are you seeing government contractors evolve to meet this need? Um, so, so dealing with both, both of those threats, I mean, I think from this convergence of cyber and physical, uh, we we step, took a step back and we asked our customers, 
you know, how do they think about it? How do they procure solutions for that? How do they think about those threats from a high to low level? So what we came up with is this idea of LEXO. We call it Layered Extended Security Operations. It's a convergence of the cyber and the physical threat, but the idea is to identify threats at the earliest stages, whether physically from greater distances or from a cyber who's pinging your networks and bringing that situation, improve situational awareness to our customers. So you'll hear today, you'll hear me talk a lot about uh, LEXO, Layered Extended Security Operations, and that's just kind of this fallout from this demand of protected infrastructure. And as you mentioned earlier, a big part of Constellus's mission is to protect critical infrastructure for the United States, both domestically and overseas. Can you talk about the logistics of this mission? And can you talk a little bit about the tools and technologies you're leveraging to carry out that mission? Yeah, absolutely. Again, the, the, this is kind of Lexo theme originated from this point of there's not enough humans to protect all of the existing infrastructure and the planned critical facilities that our customers want protected. Um, there's, the labor is just not there. So Lexo is this idea of how do you augment the human or replace the human at some point. So logistically, you think about um, anywhere around the world, can you provide surveillance, complete vigilance, the unblinking eye, of a facility at greater distances. I'm talking about from an operations center here in the DC area, watching a remote operation or infrastructure in Southeast Asia that's a facility that we need to protect. Again, that we just don't have the numbers of people to protect it, but we have to leverage um, technology. And, and so again, that's a, a, big, a big challenge that we have, you know, logistically, how do you do that separation of constant watch at greater distances. And throughout your career, you've long been a champion of using real-time geospatial information to better support and inform end users in a meaningful timeline. Can you talk about how this passion intersects with your work at Constellus? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. On any given day, I mean, we're deploying over 10,000 people to protect facilities, whether it's again, in Asia, or it's here in the United States. And all of those people are protecting property that are, that are on a piece of land, a piece of geography in this world. In the past, before the digitization of data, and it was just pretty much analog, people would just take out a map, put a circle around the map and say, this is the area that I need to protect and watch. Um, today, you know, all of uh, the locations that we have have this temporal and spatial aspect to it. So our humans protecting a piece of ground anywhere around the world have access to digital information that identifies threats at a, point, uh, a certain time in a certain location, and they can bring those together to better inform our customers about the threats um, emerging around this situational awareness. Thank you. And what emerging tech solutions are catching your attention right now? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, I think that there's two areas. Uh, first of all, it's the microprocessor. Uh, in the microprocessor area, um, if you think about the human brain, so the human brain does about 100 trillion um, calculations per second. You being much younger and smarter, your brain is probably working much more faster than mine is today. I'm not sure my brain is doing 100 trillion um, transactions a, a second. Um, so when you think about um, that type of um, compute power, so the human brain is working at 100 teraflops per second. The processors that we're putting in place for Lexo do 4,000 teraflops per second. Think about that. Um, and they're doing it with a less than a thousand watts. So that works to our advantage when we're taking a lot of sensor data and bringing it in and understanding what it means. And then the other one I would say um, that's um, an emerging technology is, is this on-demand remote sensing. So today, imagine you're sitting at your home 
and you've got your ring system on your front door. But the way that we look at remote sensing now, anywhere around the world, you're going to be able to have 30, 60 satellite passes per hour over your home eventually. So imagine how do you get access to something that's watching just not your front door, but your entire yard, your community at that kind of revisit. And eventually it's going to be, imagine two minutes per hour, you're going to have someone, you know, something overhead watching you. So whether you're on vacation or whatever, being able to monitor your community, your home, your school, your business, um, every couple minutes from space, it's just, it's game changing. I'm really curious to get your thoughts on the new CHIPS Act. How do you think that legislation could impact your work at Constellus? It's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's good legislation. I personally think it could have gone a little further, um, but from a tax advantages and stuff for different businesses that are integrating a pure, what I would call a, a U.S. solution. Um, I think that's the, the step in the right direction. Again, I don't think it went far, but that impacts, that impacts us. So we provide security cameras. We provide processors around um, our facilities to protect infrastructure. And those that are, have, um, in some cases, Chinese components um, and stuff are a, a pure and uh, I would say big vulner, uh, vulnerability um, to our solutions to our customers. We need to have integrity at the microchip level all the way to the sensors. And so that's one facet. And the other facet is in a zero trust environment with communications network, protecting those networks the best we can. And we are right on top of that. I mean, we, that is a must have for Lexo and what we're going to be providing our customers. It's, it's securing the data and also having all the way down to the chip of the microprocessor, the integrity of this is a U.S. built, um, and it's not going to be jeopardized somewhere along that value chain. It's a great question. And Terry, what advice would you give to someone in your industry today? Having been a government customer, and that's our principal customers today, I think there's this level of empathy. Um, and I would advise any entrepreneur, anybody who wants to get into this industry, is to go beyond just the empathy part of your government customer. Get into their mindset. In their mindset, they're constantly thinking about policies. They're thinking about budgets. They're thinking about technologies, um, the programmatics of what they have to do on a day-in, day-out basis. You need to understand that um, because you could have the greatest idea. Um, and if you don't put your idea within the context of what they're thinking about along those all those things I just described, um, you're going to lose out. Um, so it's a little bit of this empathy, as I would call it, with the government customer taking you know, their mindset and putting your technology or your solution and how it could best fit within all those um, uh, attributes or things that they're thinking about all the time. Well, Terry, thank you so much for joining us today and for all the work you do at Constellus. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Tina Dolph, Chief Operating Officer at CRDF Global. Previously, Tina served as President and CEO of Siemens Government Technologies, and she's a four-time WASH 100 award winner. Tina, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm looking forward to speaking with you today, Summer. First of all, Tina, congratulations on your new role. I know you joined CRDF Global in May. Can you tell me about what mm -hmm. CRDF does, and what are your priorities now as Chief Operating Officer? Sure, of course. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're right. I joined CRDF back in May, of, um, so just a few months ago. Um, it is a nonprofit organization focused on global security. So we work um, directly with government institutions interested in pursuing global security. So think Department of Defense, Department of State, you know, other NGOs. Um, and our primary focus, we were actually founded back in 1995. And the premise of, of the founding of the organization was really at the end of the Cold War when 
um, the Russian nuclear scientists found themselves out of jobs. Our government was concerned about making sure they had good work to do and not work that would become harmful to uh, the United States or to the globe as, as, as an entire population. So our government put grants in place to um, fund those scientists with good work to do. And CRDF was founded as the organization to do that. Um, so that's where we got our founding over the years. You know, that's 25 years ago now. So we continue. The threats have changed, as well. I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit um, further in the conversation. But our primary mission is to continue to try to make the world a safer place. Um, my role here as a chief operating officer is I am really focused on all aspects of mission delivery. So it's me and my team that are focused in you know meeting the needs of our clients and our funders, everything from solution development to implementing the programs all around the world um, to with our partner nations to improve global security. Um, so I'm very excited. I'm still getting my legs underneath me here, but it's been a really exciting adventure so far. And can you give me an overview of the global security landscape right now? What are the trends you're seeing in this space and how is that going to impact government contractors? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, that's a big loaded question. So I'll try to do, <laughs> do my best. But the, um, when we think about global threats, there's really two things that are happening. First, we think about the, the complexity of the threats. Like when CRDF was founded, you know, nuclear proliferation is, I don't want to say easy, but it's, you know, we all can agree. We can, we can um, watch supply chains, right? We know that plutonium is, um, not usually used for good things, right? So it was an easier threat to track. Um, now, when you think about cybersecurity, disinformation, um, some of the those tools are very, very good, and some are can be very, very problematic. So the complexity of how you ch challenge those threats becomes harder. Um, and the world is different now um, from a from a standpoint of the world agreeing around global norms. Right. We all kind of agreed, you know, there's treaties around nuclear weapons. Right. And we all agreed what is bad versus good. Um, think about cybersecurity. It would be hard today in today's world to get the world to agree on what is good cyber and prohibited cyber. So how do you then fight those things? Right. So I think we've got more complex threats and um, not as many global norms. So that's kind of the environment that we're working in. Um, but interestingly enough, back about a month ago, we had a, a, a conference here where we brought together some of the leading minds in counter threat reduction from across the enterprise. So we had representation from the office of ISN at Department of State. We had DITRA from DOD. Um, we had uh, some congressional representation. And they all talked about the same thing when they talked about global security threats. And it really had to do with four main areas. Um, the first one was really cybersecurity, which we've talked a little bit about. And, um, and as we're all seeing with the current conflict in Ukraine, you know, helping those countries to fortify their cybersecurity posture has proven to be very successful for that country as they fight the, the war that they're facing. Um, the second one that we see a lot of, of, of traction around, or unfortunately, is disinformation. I think we all, you know, we see it every day on Facebook and Twitter. And whether you're talking about a recipe or you're talking about a political outcome, um, what's true anymore, right? And and we all have to be more smart consumers of information. And, and how how do we how do we combat that when disinformation can be very destabilizing to the global economy and the safety of of the globe, right? Um, Think about global health, you know, the pandemic, um, you know, when you talk, I will tell, I will tell you this job, there's parts, days in this job, it's a little terrifying because <laughs> you talk to some of the global health experts about climate change and what that's going to do to our environment and how, you know, these pandemics that we just went through are probably going to become more common as the climate changes. So um, we think about both global health and climate change um, and you kind of wrap that all up in um what does that do to civilian infrastructures, right? So if you think about um, a tsunami taking out an island, right, or heat, um, or what we saw happen with some of the hard winters we have where energy sources go down, you know, all of those things are things that are facing our, our, our globe. And so I think when we at CRDF think about that, one of the things we are working to try to do is 
focus on just a few of those things and try to make real impact because you could get lost in the complexity of it all. Um, the good thing that the, the thing that helps me, you know, sleep at night as I as I learn about this new world is we've got a lot of really smart people, not only in our government, but also in governments around the world who are very focused on addressing these these challenges. And hopefully together as a global community, we can we can combat them together. So, Tina, given these important issues in global security, where are you looking to take CRDF Global under your leadership? Can you talk a little bit about your expansion strategy? Over the last few years, what we've come to realize is to truly be global and make the impact that we need to make in these regions, we need to be um, in, in those places. So historically, we've had offices in Amman, Jordan, and in Kazakhstan, um, and places like that, and Kyiv, Ukraine. But what, we've, what has changed for us is we really have now made global expansion a key part of our strategy. And our goal, as we like to say, is we want to get to a point where the sun never sets on CRDF Global so that we truly are a network of hubs as opposed to a headquarters office. So um, we currently have a hub office in Amman. We have one in Kyiv. Um, um, and I will tell you that 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 group of people has been amazing through the challenges that they are facing. They are some of the smartest, strongest individuals I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, so we are happy to to continue to support them and do good work there. Uh, we are off at opening an office in Manila um, next month. So we hope to you know, in, with, have uh, a Southeast Asia footprint. And we soon have our sights on places like Central Asia and Africa and South America. So one of the big parts of my new job is to thoughtfully help the company grow into all of those hub of offices and really create the infrastructure behind the offices so that Regardless if you're here in you know, North America or you're over in the Philippines or you're um, in Africa, if you're working for CRDF, you have a common platform to operate from and you get the same service from each one of our offices throughout, throughout the planet. So it's um, gonna be a little bit of a challenge. You know, we're small but mighty. We have about 300 people today and we're growing, um, but we're really focused on that, that global footprint and more importantly, the infrastructure and the flexibility that comes with that. And, and the next question would be, well, why, right? And we find that, you know, if you're going to make global impact, you're best to do that with people from the region. So the other part of our expansion strategy is we are not looking to have expats go fill these offices around the world. We hire, they are led by local employees. Um, I think one of the neatest things at CRDF right now is our our um, South uh, East Asia hub is coming online and our Amman hub is led right now by almost all female management team, which in the Middle East is very unique, right? So we're not only looking to, uh, you know, we look at our mission not only to improve global security, but also to provide opportunities for our employees in the region to advance in the corporation. And um, hopefully if I do my job well, someday the COO for CRDF Global will not be here in the United States and we will be in sitting in one of our hubs um, around the world so that we can um, continue to make that impact. So it's pretty exciting, um, pretty challenging, but the team I think is looking forward to, to tackling that challenge together. And Tina, what advice do you have for executives and specifically women in government contracting? What does it take to get to where you are? Oh my goodness, um, so many things. Um, <laughs> um, but I would say, like, I think, well, and I think this is true regardless, uh, you know, male or female. But I think when I look back at my career, is I always kind of looked at myself as, you know, and it's probably because my dad was an engineer, right? So he kind of taught me this. But I always thought about, you know, I looked at myself as a toolbox, right? And what tools do you need in your box to be successful for wherever you're trying to go? Um, you know, if you had told my 23-year-old, 24-year-old self that I would someday be a CEO, COO, I would have probably laughed at you because <laughs> uh, that really wasn't even on my radar at that point in time. But I've had some really good mentors along the way. Um, and what they taught me is, you know, really look for that next experience. Like, don't worry. I had a really smart woman tell me early in my career, don't worry about the titles or the pay. 
worry about the next experience that you need to get on your to get to where you want your journey to go. And if you do that, those other things just take care of themselves. You know, so I think that's a really big piece of advice. Um, the second piece of advice I'd give people, especially in the government contracting world, is it is a very big industry, but a very small community. Right. So um, networking and and finding people who are in the industry that you can lean on and talk to. Um, like I think I think about the pandemic, like in the early days of the pandemic, I was leading an organization and none of us knew what we were doing. Right. Um, but through you know organizations like Executive Mosaic and others, you know, I was able to reach out to networks that I had created through. Um, you know, reaching out to those people to figure out, you know, what are you doing? And are you sending your people home? Are you keeping them in the office? What are you doing? Right. Um, so I think creating that network of people who help you along the way is really, really important. Um, and then just take that next challenge. Like there are so many times I took a job where I thought there is no way in my head, I thought there is no way I'm qualified for this. Right. But how am I going to, um, do this challenge. And it's like, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out, you know? And um, I think because I had that support system around me through the network and the mentors and so forth, I think that made it easier for me to take that next challenge. Um, and look at, here I am, right? So um, I think um, I think it's, it's kind of a, it's a journey for all of us. And I think the important part is just try to figure out where, where do you think you're headed and look for that next best experience and try to make that happen. Well, Tina, thank you so much for sharing your insights today and for all the work you do at CRDF Global. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you again for having me on your program today. I really appreciated our time together. In the following interview, I sit down with Stu Shea, President, Chairman, and CEO of Paraton. Stu previously served as Chief Operating Officer for SAIC, and he was the Principal Architect in the creation of Lidos, where he then served as President and COO. Stu also founded the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation, and he's a six-time WASH 100 award winner. If you enjoy this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, we want to hear from you. Do you have a question for GovCon's leaders? If so, please drop a comment below or email studio at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Stu Shea, President, Chairman, and CEO of Paraton. Stu, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, absolutely, Summer. Looking forward to it. So, Stu, can you talk about some of the changes you've seen in the national security landscape in recent years, especially through the lens of the pandemic and the ongoing conflict in Ukraine? How are you seeing industry respond? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I would see the two very different uh, between the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Uh, when you think about the pandemic, this is something that we've been pushing at Periton for quite a number of years, and that is this more expansive view of what national security is all about. It deals not only with defense and intelligence, but also financial stability, economics, uh, you know, health, pandemics, et cetera. And, and what we see is the intricacies and the interconnectivity of all of those elements of our national security infrastructure. A supply chain issue has implications to our defense posture and our defense systems. Uh, the economics of the environment or the lack of travel have, have people kind of covered in to their own world. And I, I think as a result of all of this, we realize that this world is really interconnected and therefore our national security is also really interconnected. So I, I see that as a, a really interesting shift that we've been predicting for quite a number of years. With regard to the war in Ukraine, uh, unlike other wars where we are actively involved in protecting democracy around the world or serving one of the uh, NATO nations or others, in this case, it's a little hard for us to participate fully because of the nature of the opposing force with Russia, with potentially China's involvement and others. And so I, I see us being a little bit on the outside uh, you do see certain individuals stepping in. Uh, what uh, Elon Musk did with Starlink is uh, phenomenal. He jumped right in and said, I'm going to provide, you know, Internet service to people instantaneously. And, and that is very different from the way that we engage in most activities. Uh, back in the Gulf War a number of years ago, the uh, creation of the MRAP vehicles uh, was another example uh, where Secretary Gates came in and said, we need to have these to protect our, our soldiers. 
And so I see us kind of sitting, waiting on the outside, hoping not to get fully in, but still providing great intelligence and support to our NATO allies. And I see what, you know, probably the biggest thing is the world has come to the aid of the Ukrainian people and believe that that is a a really uh, reprehensible thing that the Russians have done in terms of their encroachment in Ukrainian borders. And so as industry is responding to these and other major changes, what do you think is separating the good government contractors from the great ones? Wow. Uh, you know, being good or great or being bad or, or really bad is really in the eyes of the witness or beholder. And I, I look at it very simply as uh, great companies are made up of great people and great solutions. And great people create great uh, systems and great support for our nation's warfighter, for our clandestine service, for our public servants, uh, whatever that is, and, and really help our families. I think Periton is a great company. I think there are many great companies. I think there are many companies that are good companies. But the people that really attract the, the best talent and deliver the best systems and what we call missions of consequence, I think are the companies that people would define in, in arrears as great. That's a good point. And I want to ask you, what is your strategy for attracting and also retaining top level talent, especially in today's talent shortage? Uh, also a great question. You know, we're in a talent war right now. And my belief is that the it's a seller's market, right? It's not a buyer's market. And so employees have lots of choices. And, and where are they going to want to go? They're going to want to go to great companies. They're going to go to a place where the company is doing something that is of significance. That's something that has a consequence where they can get emotionally attached to it. You want to be able to give them a safe place to work. And that's safe from environmental hazards, safe from threats, safe from retaliation, safe from all elements of uh, the daily social lives that we deal with. You want to pay them fair compensation. You want to give them benefits that are attractive to them. You want to give them a place where they can work in an environment where they get to challenge themselves, they have mobility, they have the agility to move and take on new challenges, accepting failure as a, a kind of a step in that process. That's hard to do in this market unless you can hit on all cylinders. You have to be able to create a place that's fun, attractive, intellectual stimulating, well compensated, uh, fair, uh, and safe to work at. And I, and I think we've done that. I, we did that as, as part of our employee value proposition uh, many years ago, but I think others do it as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that seem like they're great because they have foosball tables and, you know, lounge chairs. Great. But that doesn't mean they're doing anything of any importance. So you need to have that, that motivation. Uh, when you get motivated, when you get emotionally charged, like rooting for a, a football team, you know, when you get really emotional about it, that is a good place to work. But you also have to feel like it's fun to go every day. And so that's how I think I would define an attractive employee value proposition, which then ties to your first question is, what, does that make it a great company? And I want to take a closer look inside Periton. You've spoken before about how Periton is built on a mosaic of different elements. And you've certainly been instrumental in bringing those elements together cohesively. Can you tell us about the status of the integration of Periton's recent acquisitions like Northrop Grumman's IT business and Perspecta, and what benefits are you seeing come out of that? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting process. I've done a lot of acquisitions, a lot of divestitures, and in that process, a lot of companies always focus on the things, right? They focus on the systems, the tools, the processes, the policies, and, and that's not the right way to bring together. In our case, we had four concurrent organizations, Heritage Periton, Heritage Northrop, Heritage Perspecta, Heritage Vion, and then the divestiture of Arcfield at the exact same time. So what we did was we focused on the emotional part, the missions of consequence, the things that are important to everybody, the culture of the company, uh, the representation of a diverse set of employees, uh, how we wanted to you know, take care of people during COVID. All of that became a, a glue that held the fabric of the company together. 
So then when we went to do all the hard work and move everybody's cheese and change their computing systems or their processes or the policies, it was a little bit more amenable to people. Uh, we also moved with a great degree of speed in our integration. Most companies would take 18 months to integrate what we've done in seven. Uh, and so we are done with the integration with a few minor elements. I think we had 500,000 different items in our integrated master schedule. Of those 500,000, there's probably 100 that are left. Uh, and, and some of them are substantive, you know, moving people out of one building into another building. But, but there are things that we took with great speed because we felt as soon as we could get people locked down and refocused on doing the great missions that we support, it would be a, a more easy integration of the very disparate uh, backgrounds of the people. We also focused on what was common in the people as opposed to their differences. Uh, I always felt like, you know, whether you're supporting the Postal Service or you're supporting the CIA or you're supporting the, the U.S. Navy, all of those organizations have a mission and those missions matter. And so if we could get people to realize that the missions of all of those customers are important, they're of consequence, then it would make for a better integration. And we also mixed up the team. We moved people around that had different leaders. Uh, we blended the families and, and that gave a sense of one uh, that I think was important for us. So we're, we're ostensibly done in our integration. Well, congratulations. And Stu, I'm curious, do you anticipate further consolidation within the national security market? You know, I've been doing this 40 years and uh, there is no shortage of acquisitions. There's no shortage of divestitures. There's no shortage of renaming of companies. There's no shortage of changes in focus in companies. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to end because I don't think it's a, something that happens and then, then it doesn't happen. It's a natural part of the process. Small companies grow into bigger companies. Bigger companies separate themselves into smaller companies. People leave bigger companies and start their own company and they create their own company and then they grow and then they're acquired and then they, they leave and they start their own company. This is the evolution of, of business. So I don't believe that the market dynamics are gonna change. Now, there is certainly concerns that you have to make sure uh, that you focus on in terms of doing it right according to antitrust rules and Department of Justice, that's, that's fine. But the government is also uh, changing the competitive landscape. The US government owns the complete responsibility for how they contract with industry. And the reality is some of their old ways of doing business where they were the integrator no longer works. They need big integrators to be able to bring together the hundreds of small companies that might provide a solution to them. So we act as a prime to many small businesses. We have a, a really aggressive small business portfolio, but we do that because we have the capacity to integrate. And there are other companies like us that do that as well. I think that's important, but at some point, the focus of the company gets too diffuse. There's a line of business that doesn't make sense. So what do you do? You sell it off to somebody else who now creates a company who then five years later may be acquired. So it's just a natural evolution that I, I think is gonna continue. I think it's encouraging. I think the US government controls most of our own destiny uh, and then we all respond to it. So as you mentioned, within this ever-changing market, how do you set your priorities? What are the key factors that go into your bidding and acquisition decisions? Yeah, so any company will do what they do best, right? So they want to do things that, that make the most sense, that are aligned both with their priorities, and then they have to make an investment to be able to pursue that. For us, we focus on what we call next generation national security. We want to focus on missions of consequence, things that matter to people. We want to focus on the stuff that's hard to do. We don't want to be a commodity business. We want to be a business that focuses on the toughest problems. So as you begin to think about the bigger markets, what we do is we take that big market and we skinny it down to the things that are resilient, that are difficult, that, are, that require a, an element of mission understanding, historical you know, understanding of a mission of a customer, are often differentiated by technology. So that's where we're gonna focus. So you take any market, cyber, 
We like to focus on the offensive part of cyber, not the defensive. Space, we focus on the core elements of protection of our space systems, not the more commodity uh, parts of the space systems. Uh, and, and by doing that, we're able to focus on something that is resilient between administrations, resilient in terms of history because it's important stuff that has to be done, and it has a higher barrier to entry. When we do that, as long as we have the skills and the chops to do it, or, and the security clearances and the investment portfolio, then we are in a smaller group of competitors that is highly differentiated. And so we'll continue to do that in each of our markets. And Stu, you've been in the government contracting world for decades, and you've been at the top of some of the industry's biggest players. What advice do you have for executives looking to advance their careers? What does it take to get to where you are? Yeah, I would say don't paint within the lines. Uh, I, I believe you have to have your own credo, your own code of conduct, your own uh, North Star, right? When you have that that navigation ability, I, I think you have to live by that set of values. Uh, I think it has to be core to who you are. Uh, you have to be consistent in your application of those processes. And I think a lot of what uh, leadership is all about is uh, building trust. I, I think trust is the currency of leadership. So you build it, don't squander it. You have to cherish that trust, and then you have to extend it to the people that work with you. Uh, I've, I've said before, you know, be careful of the people that you step over in your career because they could be your boss someday. Uh, you know, I, I think it's really important that you just build a network of trust and honesty and transparency and partnership and not get into uh, hatred or, or competition that, that goes wrong. I, I have great friends in this market and they are great competitors, uh, but they're always, I'm always respectful of them and I hope that they're always respectful of me. I think when you have that respect and that trust, then, you know, we will be able to, to battle each other and still be friends and work together, right? And so we'll, it's often called competitors. I think that's important. And so I think executives need to build that fabric of who they are and make sure that they live it every single day. Well, Stu, thank you so much for your insights and for all the work you do at Periton. Thank you, Summer. Appreciate the time.